we get to have a compost check in with everybody out there and throw your questions at us. We're all here to, to answer them and, and kind of work through them. Today, we were pleasantly surprised to have Dawn. She's from our compost community and she's here to, to, to jump in the conversation. She's got some great questions and yeah, honestly, Peter and Catherine and I are, are just, we're really thrilled to have somebody from the community here to talk about their experience. So everyone say hi to Dawn. Hey, Dawn. <laughs> hi. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we are, yeah, like we do most Dr. Compost episodes, we'll go through the questions on um, uh, on the previous week. People have been asking questions and popping them in there. Uh, the first one that we have, oh, why not before I do that, Dawn, do you want to, do you feel comfortable sharing a little bit about your, your composting journey and where you're at and why you're here? Um, I haven't started yet. I'm at the beginning, beginning. Right. I'm looking into, like I said, from the YouTube, I'm looking at the site of how big the the bed can be, how tall it has to be, what can I put in it, what size um, pot to put in it. I don't want to go mini. I want to do the the regular the regular pot, um, and how to start it off, and how big can I go around my my pot, and how many worms to put in it. And I think I'm scared of the worms. Oh no! <laughs> really good questions. <laughs> they're, not, they're not going to bite you. Don't worry. Okay. Everybody, everybody that comes at the, at the initial stage has those questions. So, like, thank you for, for bringing them up. I, why don't, like, Catherine and Peter, if you feel comfortable, like, why don't we go through these questions as somebody that's never composted before and is at the very start? We, where are you calling in from? Was it Florida, Dawn? I'm calling from Miami, Florida, yes. I am Florida. Great. Uh, okay, so your first question, I can remember, was you want to get the regular size sub pod, but you want to know how big of a garden bed you can put that in? Right. Peter, do you want to answer that question? Yeah. So the good the good news is there's no upper limit. Really, it's about um, how how easy it is for you to get around the bed. So typically, you might have the width of the bed to be under I don't know three feet wide, so you can get around to the middle from both sides. Um, and so the thing is, with your your regular size classic, you could sit that toward the front of of um, one of the walls of the bed. But then it all depends on how much yard space you've got. And also, okay. um, you're yeah, like that's a great example, Catherine. That's the sort of the bare minimum size where you're making the most of a small space and using vertical trellising and stuff, so you can have your sub pod and then a little bit of soil there can can get you going. But uh, we were talking earlier, and I know you want a bit more space to grow food, so I would go bigger than that. Just um, hmm. just just um, there's no upper limit really because you can basically take your compost out of the the sub pod when it's ready and spread it around to all the plants. Okay. And so How do you know when it's ready? How do you know what they call that black gold? How do you know when that's you have it? So how do you know yeah, when you have it? That's it there? Okay. Pretty much, pretty much um, we, we have guides on Grow Hub that kind of go through the process that basically as the system's filling up, because um, you're getting the classic, you can stop feeding one side and the worms move over to the other side to keep feeding on the scraps you're giving. And so the stuff that you haven't been feeding, it's maturing. And so you can harvest that a few weeks after you've done your last feed. Oh, okay. And, See and another way that you can, an indicator of knowing that it's finished compost is that there won't be any rotten food waste in there. Like it will be a black color. So looking at the color, also the, the, the smell as well, like the, it should smell a bit of an earthy smell and and touching it as well like it should have a texture which kind of crumbles <laughs> you're okay. squirmish of it there it, it should... <laughs> the <worms. laughs> well the, as okay. peter was saying the uh having the divider panel which is the sub pod you have if you stop feeding one area most of the worms will migrate across to where there's food so you'll be able to collect that we have a few videos on on how to harvest that easier Okay. Okay. So you will be using one side and then you go over to the other side. At at the okay. end. So you, you can feed both sides all the way up until it's getting full. And then in fact, it's better to do both sides. And then what happens is, is, as the whole thing is filling up. So you'll see when you look inside the sub pod, you'll see these little tiny aerator panels at the very top. And right. once, once it's getting close to those, you know, you're, you're getting ready to, to uh, actually harvest it might take six months before it gets all the way full. 
Uh, and so you'll just be adding your food scraps and gradually it'll be filling up. And if you wanted to use compost before then, we have ways of actually taking a handful of the compost plus worms and making a liquid fertilizer you can fertilize your plants with in the meantime. So, um, okay. but, the, but the actual point where you've got a harvest is when it's full. And then you just okay. stop feeding one side and then circle okay. the other side. Okay. okay. And Dawn, okay. have you thought about materials of, because if you're, if you're purchasing a larger garden bed, have you thought about building it yourself or, or buying another one? Because there's a lot of options. I was out thinking there. of using a, another, like a, I guess you all could call it a third party. I was thinking of using a third party because they have one that's like a horseshoe. Oh, so cool. I was thinking about using a third party one and it's exactly like yours. It's, uh, it has enough of space in the middle for me to put the to put the sub pot to put the mini pot there the sub pot in the middle. That's why I say how big do you go because if they're there, will they commute all the way around back into the um, sub pot? Good question. They, they're they're more likely to if you add mulch to the top of the soil because their favorite habitat in nature is to actually be traveling just under the leaves, and so they'd be cruising around on the surface of the of the soil but underneath that mulch in the picture there. And okay. so if you if you spread that mulch around your bed and keep it moist underneath, they'll they'll be checking it all out. The whole okay. bed. So like that's like a that's like hay. Is that what that's, they call yeah, it? Yeah, like bleach? yeah, hay or straw, yeah. In in Australia we have access to sugarcane mulch. So that gets shredded up and that works too. Oh, y'all so lucky. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. yeah, are there, were there other questions you had or is that pretty much? Uh, I think that's for now it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, keep keep coming. That's, that's, that's the advantage of you being here in person. If something else comes up, you can raise your hand and we'll come. Yeah, in. please do. There's also a private okay. chat down the bottom that you can pop a question into if, if, you, if you need to. I'll see if you're okay. Oh, that's do. true. Okay. Okay. If I think of anything else. Okay. Okay, but I'll sit and watch and see if y'all have any more other questions that comes across the bottom or y'all discuss what's next coming up for the next post. Yeah, we, we've got it. We've got questions on this right hand side. Should I should I open up the first one, Peter? Yeah. Yeah, okay. we can do the next one. Yeah. So this is a this is a question from Rebecca um, from the Grow Hub. And um, she's had this this frustrating experience where she puts plants into her raised bed and the seeds will spread. Out, but just when they're little tiny seedlings, they didn't never get much further than that. And so she's showing you, showing us that image. I think she said a watermelon um, seed. And she says there's little mud balls that form around the seedlings. And she was asking if, if the worms could be disturbing the uh, tiny plants. Well, I can tell you that for sure, the uh, compost worms don't bother the living plants at all. They only, they only go after the, um, the, the breaking down food. But um, when you see those little piles of mud balls, depending on where you live, there are these invasive jumping worms now that compost in a little different way where they end up leaving these little piles that are more like people call them coffee ground looking. Normally compost worms, it's more of a smooth kind of um, textured uh, compost that they generate, but these, these um, jumping worms generate a different product entirely and they do attack the uh, young young plants so that's a possibility is maybe they've gotten into the system i'm not sure if we have an image of what those look like on um on our on our gallery here but they basically they're very distinctive they have like a, a literally cream colored band around their middle and um we're just learning about them because they tend to be in some of the southern states at the moment like texas and north and south carolina i think for the most part and um i don't i don't think i've heard any of them being in florida yet so i think you should be fine up okay. there yeah that's that's exactly what i'm talking about when you see that very distinctive yellow band that goes all the way around the worm that that's that's a sign that they it's an invasive worm that's come from asia that's that's just um more aggressive and see notice the texture of the compost around where it's kind of lumpy like that um that's that's the sort of um uh, the castings they produce, which is which is a bit different. So that's one possibility for what's happening with those seedlings um, mm. in that question. And um, yeah, so to to find out if that's what's going on, 
Um, one thing I would consider doing is transplanting some larger plants into the into the bed rather than starting from seeds or start your seeds in a little nursery first and then transfer them over when they're stronger and uh, and see if they fare better and um and then also um we're, we're going to be putting out some more resources for how to deal with the jumping worms but basically the the real remedy is to isolate your bed from the ground so the the jumping worms can't get into it in those places where it's happening Okay, then the next question we've got is about should they continue to dampen the worm blanket? So they're at the stage now where they're ready to harvest one side of their classic subpod, and so they start feeding that side. And um, they want to know if they need to wet that blanket. No, nope, no need to do that. Um, in fact, if you keep it dry, you'll actually encourage more of the worms to move over to the other side. So that's what I'd recommend is is, is stop moistening the blanket while you're while you're not feeding that side. Okay, next question we've got. You like this question? Is Peter? from Donald. Donald what are you okay. using to compost? Yeah, so this is an interesting question because if your compost is very fresh, it's almost fudge-like or, or very thick and it doesn't, it doesn't fall through a, a lifter easily. And so what I do, and I've just created a nice article to show people how to do this, it's just by a nice big flat tub um, that's shallow, and then you spread out your compost in that. So, um, the worms worms actually avoid light, and so what'll happen is you put that in the sun, and then after about ten minutes, the worms will go down below, and um, uh, you just scrape off that top layer of of compost into another bucket, and little by little, the worms keep going down, keep scraping off that top surface. And um, so you're doing it by hand rather than sifting it. Um, the thing is, you'll the advantage of doing it that way too is if you have any bits of food that haven't all the way broken down, you can collect those and put them into a second bucket and put that back into your pod. But this doesn't take very long at all, especially if you had a couple buckets and we're doing them in tandem. You do one, you clear off the top layer. By the time you've gone to the second one, cleared it off, the first one's ready to be cleared again. And uh, you can you can get through a half chamber of the classic in in uh, in easy time. And it's even a, if you're well, sorry, I was just like I was doing it for the probably the first time really using a sifter, and the end result is just really friable, like nice fluffy soil that you get. It makes a huge difference, especially if you're doing seedlings. So I remember when you started to suggest it a while ago, Peter. Now I'm using it. I'm like, wow, it's a it's a really good tip to just take your compost to the next level. Yeah, it's it's a good point, especially when you are starting tiny seeds. You want a very fine textured compost to be adding so that the seeds are have an easy time of pushing up through the material to get to the sunlight. And so um, one possibility is this the the sifters that I've generated, I've I've bought um, ones um, from a, like an Indian grocery store where they, they they're sifting like um, small beans and stuff because the normal flower sifters are way too fine. Uh, so so you want to have gaps in them that are probably about a quarter of an inch in size if you're using American units and about um, 10 millimeters if you're using metric units. And that's that's a pretty good size. So, so typically you can buy a roll of mesh from a hardware store. And then I have a little um, example on an article in GrowHub that just shows you how to staple that into a frame wooden frame and just sift through that i don't know peter what you were using for years oh uh, well i had a friend that gave me some sips from a nursery so that was there was two different perfect. grades there i was lucky that's, enough to get it yeah that's a good example so so if you have a specialty garden store that sells compost sifters of course those would work perfectly well because they're designed just for that purpose and then catherine mentioned that she was using um uh, in, in, in Australia, we do a lot of catching our rainwater and they have these uh, grids that sit on the top of the uh, rain tanks. Um, at my place, they're way too fine to work for that, but probably at some places, if they're open like that size I was ex explaining, it would work well to, to sift. I like it. It's like panning for gold too. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it felt like when I did mine. But I thought the other interesting tip that you had in one of the articles I was reading of yours the other day, uh, Peter, was about if you're germinating seeds, 
that to be aware that in the castings, because worms never, yeah, there's a, there's a nice picture. Perfect of example, yeah. Yeah, is that the worms never um, eat or, or break down a viable seed. So that's where it's really great about compost coming out of a sub pod is you're going to end up with all these seeds from like tomato plants or pumpkins or whatever, you know, seeds you might have thrown in with your food scraps. But that if you want to use it as a, as a seed grown medium that you need to almost like, as you said, pre germinate pre to make sure that, yeah, pre sprout so that you're not, your seedlings aren't competing with perhaps, you know, a seed that's already, you know, in the, in the castings. It's true. You you can you can like let's say you went and you went to the trouble of buying some really nice heirloom tomato seeds, and you're all excited by getting those to sprout, but you haven't pre-sprouted your your compost from the sub pod. Then you might have competing seedlings and get confused about which is which. So so the easy thing to do though is, is because seeds will sprout so readily is you just take a layer of the compost you've harvested and uh, go ahead and put that in a little bit of sun and within a week you'll you'll sprout out all the seeds that are in there and what's cool is i've noticed when i've done that is it doesn't have to be too shallow a layer this the seeds will find their way to the top it can be a couple inches deep or you know what would that be 10 15 centimeters deep 20 centimeters deep even and uh that the seeds will find their way to the top to sprout so then you just pluck those out and use the sprout mix I just got a question from Dawn come in uh -huh. and what type of worms are best for what area of living? Okay, so uh, this is the thing about um, for composting your food waste, you use a specialty worm that's a compost worm as opposed to a normal earthworm. So usually when you, you go to like um, people that sell compost worms and that's what you'd look for, they're a red wriggler, is the typical uh, classic European composting worm. The fancy uh, name is um, a, a Cinea fetida, um, but um, that's the typical standard worm. There's also um, night crawlers that people sell, and also the third one is um, Indian blues. Those are the three most common composting worms. And if you look in your area, like um, around Florida, example there will be people advertising worms and one of the nice things about the climate there is that you can be comfortably composting year-round the worms won't slow down too much in the winter time especially in miami it won't get too cold for you there at all yeah that's okay. yeah the a tip i would suggest i just saw a guy on grow hub who is i think he was i think he was in new york uh and he bought worms from texas and I think it might have taken a few days in the postage. And because of that, the worms are like half dead by the time they got there. And I imagine that they got stuck in the post and Texas is quite hot. So if you can buy the worms locally, it's always going to be best uh, because there's always a little bit uncertainty when those worms travel from A to B. Yeah, look, I also suggest to people, you know, if you can source like a, a nursery or a community garden or a permaculture association that might already have worms um, and you go along with a container to collect the worms, you're going to get a much better volume of worms for your money because they're not having to ship it through the post. Just um, just make sure they're compost worms, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, <laughs> not worms. Worms. Yeah, yeah. But, and also you're supporting something local and you're getting worms that are adapted to your environment, all those those great things. Um, but look, good old Uncle Jim's, they have a good uh, mailing yeah, service do. online if you can't find it. There are lots of resources on the Grow Hub of suggestions of places to order them through. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole lot of articles in, our, in the Grow Hub you can just search out. Um, I think there's a whole section about worms. So we were encouraging any worm suppliers to add their details. So, yeah that there should be some good tips as well. Okay. 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 Next question we have is um, from Cynthia. She says her sub pod is full of fruit flies. Is that an indication that I need more carbon? Could be. So, so typically fruit flies will go in when um, you've added fruit. And uh, what happens is when fruit rots, it gets a bit of yeast growing on it and the fruit flies love to go after that. And so the one thing I would first off recommend is um, have enough bedding in your sub pod that you can fully bury the fresh food waste under the surface of the bedding. That'll discourage the, um, the yeast from growing on it in a way that'll draw in the fruit flies. 
Um, as far as needing carbon, it all depends on moisture levels. That's my number one sort of rule of thumb is check the moisture level of the bedding. If it's if it's really, really wet, you're using the carbon to kind of dry the bedding out. If it's gotten too uh, fudgy and sludgy, then um, adding the carbon will fluff it out. And the carbon I particularly like to add for that is the um, coconut core, the shredded coconut husk um, bedding, because it's very, it's fibrous, and so it'll bring in lots of light and, sorry, lots of air, so it'll keep the texture of the uh, bedding fluffy. Um, so, yeah, that'll take care of fruit flies for sure, just drying it out a bit and burying the food waste. Hey, Peter, while we're talking about coconut core, just back on this guy that bought worms from this Texas, Texas worm supplier, uh, he told them that he added coconut core and they got back to him like, well, coconut core can have salt in it. Uh, so like basically they were saying that it was his fault. And I was like, well, you know, if you got it from a gardening store, it's yeah. so unlikely that have yeah. you had any experience with coconut core having salt in it? So, so, so the thing is, is that any garden supply place has to test their core ahead of time because the salt is going to hurt plants as well as, as worms. And so, um, you, you might have a shipment that comes from, say, the Philippines or Sri Lanka or wherever the core is coming from, and it's the obligation of the um, suppliers to test it or have certification of testing to show that the salinity levels are down um, because they get into trouble with their own supplies very quickly. So anything you would buy at, say, Home Depot or, or Bunnings, that's already been thoroughly tested to verify it's, it's low salt. Oh, that's and, good. Yeah, uh, I pass that on to him. I thought that was a bit far fetched for them to blame him for putting well, coconut core. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's the sort of thing where you want to go to a reputable supplier. So I could very well imagine if you went on Amazon and you mm. found the cheapest material that wasn't from a regular reputable uh, distributor, um, it could it could be problematic. But if you went to a nursery that supplies this for for planting, um, it'll it'll be you can use it with confidence. Oh, cool. Well, oh, thanks for that. Sorry, I just hijacked it. No, um, that's, that's fine. Okay, yeah. So this is someone, um, Lauren, who's um, just gotten her sub pod installed, and she's curious to know if she should wait until the la after the last frost to purchase and add the worms. You know, uh, yeah, it's that frosty for sure. Um, <laughs> um, what I would say, though, is that it's true that in the beginning, when you have fewer worms, you want to have gentle conditions, especially if you're inexperienced in starting out worms, because they'll be a little slower off the mark in colder places or colder times of the year. Uh, Don, you won't have any trouble in Florida. Any time of year is fine to start start your system. Okay. But in other, in other places um, where you have cold winters, it's going to be easier to start your system if you wait until till spring after the, after the frost. And then but then don't worry, once the worms are fully established, we've got lots and lots of guides and help and suggestions for how to keep the worms going. If you're in a state where you actually get snow and, uh, and ice, you can keep the whole system insulated and get going through winter. But that's that's easier to do when you've got a full established worm population in the way. Okay. I had another question. I'm not thinking of typing it in. What do we do, I guess for me, for rainy season, because I know I remember when y'all was saying how you, um, when you make the compost tea, that yep. you have to put the worms and bring them back out. How do you handle rainy season, uh, long or a lot of rainy season? And for me, hurricanes, how do oh, you yeah. tend to that part? Good question. So, so if you get really heavy, heavy downpours into the garden bed, you might want to think about just putting a tarp over and protecting you know to a lot of uh, rain from flooding into the soil because what will happen is the sub pot itself is fine it's got a lid and the rain won't get into it directly but because the walls of the sub pot have holes in them if the soil in the garden bed is saturated with with rain water then that wet will wick inside of the sub pot and make it too wet it's true that you can always just add carbon afterwards like if you if you just have say a surprise storm and it floods heavily um, if you're if you're in a raised garden bed most of that excess water will drain down to the ground and it won't be a problem but you just check inside your sub pod 
and see if it's if it's a bit wetter than it should be. You just add a bit of dry carbon, and uh, as long as you haven't waited too long, you'll be fine. Okay. 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 We've had some pretty serious floods recently, so there's been a lot of yeah. Oh, you it's, all did. Oh, no, we did, and I can I can happily Not report that, that that my I had I had literally like let's see putting it into American units. We had probably three feet of rain in a week, a and a uh, everything was fine. So, um, okay. so it, it's it, it, especially in a raised bed, it would it could be problematic if you d put it right into the ground, but okay. in a raised bed, it would give yourself a lot of um, insulation. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question we've got is from Kim. Should like to know what happens to worms when you use the aerator. Uh, worms are safe <laughs> when you use the aerator. Um, no, it's good actually. It's a good question. That was my you know, question. We, too. Yeah, yeah. No. So, so if you looked at the very end of the, see how that spiral is pretty horizontal. So when it's okay. going into the into the compost and you're turning it, you're spinning horizontally, and the worms will drape themselves around the metal of the aerator, but um, it won't it won't pierce them because you're not trapping them, you know, and, and you're not, you're not um, um, cornering them. You're basically spinning that and lifting it. And so it's designed to be very gentle with worms. Okay. So they'll, they'll be fine with it. It's actually much safer than using a trowel where mm. if you had a trowel digging around and the edge of the trowel was pressing against the edge of your sub pod, you could imagine, you know, trapping a worm in there and hurting it. But uh, the aerator is actually a really useful tool for avoiding that problem. And great for harvesting. I love it when you have to harvest castings as well. Yeah, it just pulls it right out. I mean, you will have to get in with your hands to get the corners because yeah. the aerators being circular don't get into the square corners. But um, it still gives you a lot of the way there. It's definitely ergonomic. Like if you think about old school traditional composting and you use a pitchfork and you, mm -hmm. you have to use a lot of muscles for that whereas it's like just the twisting motion upright if you have a raised garden bed it's, it's quite easy i've seen children do it people in their 80s do it it's very simple yeah and you're and you're not having a big volume the way you do with heat composting where you're sitting there with a pile that's you know as tall as you are and about four times wider mm -hmm. um and that's just a lot of volume to move around but the nice thing is all this gets broken down into a very concentrated food source inside the sub pods there's less less material to handle and the worms are doing all the work for you so that's, but also that's i love it like when i go to empty my caddy you know i'm not getting my hands dirty you know i'm just opening the lid throwing the waste in throwing a bit of carbon in and then the aerator means that yeah it's it just makes it really clean as well like as far as dealing with the compost that's um, true. How long should you aerate? A lot, a little, two, three turns? Yeah, good it. good question. So what you, to answer that, the best way to do is think about what the process. You're doing two things with the aerator. One is you're mixing in the fresh waste into the bedding. And the second thing is you're fluffing up the bedding to bring in more air. So you would move the aerator around uh, the different parts of the chamber of the sub pod. So you make sure you're fluffing up all of that bedding down to the bottom. And that'll just bring in more air to make the compost break down faster. Mm, okay. well, yeah, it's about what, four to six times maybe. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Think think of it like, you know, you you go into each corner and maybe the middle. And so that's yeah, maybe six six spots, you know, four okay. to six spots on each on each side. And it also depends, like for me, if I'm using shredded paper, I mean, sometimes the shredded paper gets a little tangled in the aerator and have to sort of like, you know, try and bring it off the aerator. But, you know, it depends on what carbon source you're using. Um, so, yeah, but I just keep thinking about putting more air in there so that everyone can breathe. <laughs> okay. Because I'm thinking That's about leaves. I'm thinking about just mm, leaves, right. paper, and like he was saying, the cardboard. Um, yeah, that was one, thing. one thing I'd with for the leaves, I'd recommend letting them rot down a bit first before you put them in. So even if they're all the way dry, it's surprising how long leaves take to break down. So I recommend um, let them let them accumulate in a spot in your yard where they started to break down a little bit, and then the worms will love them because they've gotten colonized with with bacteria and stuff to um, to be softer and already starting to break down. 
Um, so yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to, to hearing more about people gathering their autumn leaves, mm -hmm. letting them rot down over the winter somewhere, and then using them as a carbon source or you know another another you know microbial source to go it's into to go into the compost. Yeah, if you have the yard space, there's there's a thing called a um, a leaf um, composter where it's just as simple as as a four sided thing with chicken wire. You just rake up your leaves, dump dump them in there maybe put the hose on it once in a while to keep it moist. And then it breaks down to this beautiful leaf mulch compost. But if it's halfway to breaking down, then you can take handfuls of that and put it into the sub pod when it's breaking down and the worms will love it. Okay. So. I like learning so much tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's always nice to use um, natural materials, you know, like, like, mm -hmm. like the leaves that are available. So, and especially the other thing you've given yourself insurance against is some leaves can have oils and stuff but by the time they've broken down um that none of that is an issue okay because we don't have no real winter oh, so that's right. our leaves yeah. are constantly falling so uh -huh. like you said doing it with the chicken wire would be mm. the best for here um, yeah. here uh, for us to do the chicken wire just build a basket and keep it in there that way so okay i'll do that what? and what? i you know i like sorry I'm sorry. I'll finish the thought. So, you know, in um, Florida, you probably have a lot of um, fronds and stuff. They're a bit tougher to break down. So, I wouldn't recommend using those until they've really broken down because they're just, they take a long time to break down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking about the other, using the variety of carbon. It's a bit like trying to mimic what happens in nature where there's a whole lot of different ingredients that go into creating new soil. And okay. you know, so it's like, you know, think about us, we don't like to be fed the same thing all the time. So I, I kind of like to vary my my carbon sources, um, and, but always try to use what I've got around that can be recycled. So like paper or cardboard or or leaves or, you know, and then to get the coir peat is kind of like a little treat every now and then. Um, or, you know, or just to balance out if it kind of gets a little bit anaerobic, you know, a bit sludgy. The, the coir peat really helps just to balance everything out. So it's also it's also pH neutral, which is nice because the worms like it around pH seven. And I I push it you know for people to consider it, especially when they're setting up their system, because it does it does three things. It creates a moist habitat that brings in air and is a food source for the worms. So um, so you can't go wrong with it. And when you're building up your confidence, then you start with that material easily to, to make sure you're creating a habitat where the worms don't leave and then uh, you can be as Catherine says be adding stuff trying stuff out seeing what works well you know as you go and get more experience our next okay. question is pretty exciting let's see uh yeah you want to bring it up there peter yep i'll pop it up oh yeah so the hammerhead worm um, this is similar to the um, to the jumping worms, where it's a bit of a, a predatory worm, and uh, you see that distinctive head, where it's 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 it got a bit of a, a, a almost like a snake head on it. Um, they tend to be in these warmer places, and um, you do try to get rid of them when they show up. But um, uh, you know, I, I have to basically work with people who have them. I had various suggestions, but ultimately um, you you want to create a habitat that protects your compost worms from them getting access to it. And so um, once you have the problem, the safest thing to do is to actually have an isolated bed that's isolated from the ground. So we have a another product called a mod bed, which is on legs. So the, the worms are protected from that. But don't worry about that until you actually have the problem. But then if it does arise, then we have a remedy for, for dealing with it. But be, be, because the raised beds are in contact with the soil, they can the hammerhead worms can travel up through the soil and, and get, get access to the um, contents. Have you seen them like, decimate populations, Peter? Or like, you know, do you think that would make a huge, huge dent in, in a fully functioning sub pod with 10,000 plus worms? Um, so the thing is, I, I don't have experience to know 
um, over time how disruptive they are. If you just had one or two, probably no problem at all. If they started to breed in large numbers, mm -hmm. they could be problematic. And it's the sort of thing where they're an invader from a different ecosystem mm -hmm. as they're showing up to with, with, especially with climate change and places warming up. And so we kind of um, have to sort of collect anecdotal information as people have experiences with them in their compost systems and then you know, fine tune our suggestions based on what people are experiencing. Oh no. Sorry, I know I'm yes. actually <laughs> eating a worm. <laughs> yeah, well, so we know that they're they're not good. That's true. And so hmm. um if it's like this person's found Maureen's found one in her system today hmm. and uh definitely um try to try to get rid of it. And I don't know, Maureen, if you have a um a raised bed or what kind of a system you have um but um we we could we could talk more about your system and see if we can see if there's a way to keep the existing system uh most likely to function but uh, the trouble is um they're, they're still working out things that would cause the uh hammerhead worms to um uh be be a kind of um dissuaded from showing up without hurting the compost worms because they're sufficiently similar that, yeah. Awesome. We, we just have one more question left, but I, for the people that are watching, I just want to invite them to ask any questions that they have. Uh, yeah, I'd love to, love to hear from you guys where you're at and what you're doing. Uh, so yeah, I'll pop on the last question, but in the meantime, for those of you out there, this is your, your last chance until next week. Okay, yeah. So, so interestingly, um, so I've actually got a photo for this, like a proper photo they sent. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Because uh, let's hold on is. to that photo. Let's hold on to that, that first one you have there. Let's go back to that. Oh, the actual Senate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you see how every segment has one pair of legs, right? If, if you look through that. Um, that's that's the way you distinguish between centipedes and millipedes. Millipedes have more than one set of legs for every segment. So mm -hmm. in case you're wondering. And so generally, the centipedes tend to be more of a problem than the millipedes. Um, um, they're not so great to have in your system, but um, there's a couple, couple things you can do. So if you go back to that other image where it shows the um, centipede with the worm, um, they they're 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 if there's one or two in the in the system i would just find some you know maybe tongs or something and pick them out because they they can bite you know in in some cases or wear gloves and, and fish them out and just keep an eye if if any are coming you want to avoid having any um kind of colony forming and taking up residence inside the subpod and so like a lot of these insects um, they are just discouraged by creating a dry environment on top. So one thing I've recommended for people who are getting rid of things like pill bugs and centipedes is to um, use what's called diatomaceous earth, which is like a, it's a, it's, it's silica product you can buy from nurseries and you can dust that on the top of your, um, uh, on your, your worm blanket and that'll discourage um, anim uh, little insects and stuff from crawling over the surface of that because it actually is is irritating for their um, their carapace, their uh, their exoskeleton. So um, so that's that's a recommendation I have for this this person, Suita. That what you can do is um, especially to be really thorough, is you could get a second. Um, worm blanket and have that dedicated as your sort of barrier to prevent these guys from getting in. So you would take that blanket, put on some diatomaceous earth, make sure that blanket stays dry because diatomaceous earth works best when it stays dry. And just make sure there's some of that on the um, top blanket. And I guarantee you'll have very few spiders mm -hmm. and bugs and stuff getting into the sub pod with, with that on top. And the good news is that diatomaceous earth is not harmful for the worms, but the reason for it being on a second blanket is just to keep it dry. So as soon as it gets wet, it's not able to effectively cut the skeleton up of the insects, which is what it does when it's dry, dry form. 
and it's really easy to get as well. You can buy it from health food stores because some people take diatomaceous earth to to clean their gut, Peter, right? Or yeah, it's it's a silica based product, um, and so you you can you can use it for various purposes. Um, like like some people will take um, uh, like like various di um, clay and 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 things to sort of help um, kind of um, in a cleansing process um i'm not haven't tried that personally myself but um but anyway there is there are food grade um diatomaceous mm -hmm. earths available that that would that would be suitable for putting in the sub pod where you're using the compost for food growing we've got a question that's come in from bernadette i'm just going to pop it up here on the screen um mm -hmm. i've had my sub pod since january it's not at level two uh is it too early to add a little bit kashi waste and, and dawn you'll notice when you get your sub pod uh there's certain levels of uh on the divider and um yeah this person's asking uh, i guess if they can put bakashi in there which is a great great question yeah they certainly can put a little bakashi in there and you know one thing that we could be interesting to do is is Worms have this behavior where if there's something they don't like, they avoid it. It's called worm worm avoidance behavior. And so it's something you can test on a substance. You're not sure, will they like this? Will they not like it? So we do know that Bakashi can be a little bit acidic. So just just so you know, Don, Bakashi is like, a, it's a treatment where you would add, you scatter these microbes on your food waste when they're in the kitchen caddy and then um, they start to break down process of the food before it goes into the sub pod. So it's actually a nice way to sort of pre-treat your food waste. Like if, like you living in a warmer climate, you could imagine if you have your food scraps at room temperature for several days, they might get a bit stinky. So you can mm -hmm. scatter a little of this Bakashi at the end of the day, just on the top of the food scraps inside and it'll pacify those smells. So it basically keeps the smells from forming. And then when the caddy is full, you can put that into the sub pod. So what I've been telling people is that um, because it's acidic, if you if you have a fair amount of compost already in your system, then it's safe to go ahead and start adding it. I wouldn't add it to a new system. But even though it's not at level two, um, the other thing that you, burn it, that you could do is you could just sprinkle a little bit of um, baking soda onto the food scraps to um to bring the ph up to to neutral so the the baking soda is uh, alkaline and the bakashi is a little bit acidic and so by sprinkling a little of that and mixing it together you're creating you know um safety and you're not going to be um hurting your worms at all that way yeah that's the bakashi grains so this is this is typically at least in australia you can buy sacks of grains that have been um, basically um, dried with the spores of the Bakashi microbes on them. And so you sprinkle a small amount, way smaller than that handful, like maybe half that handful or less, or just a tablespoon uh, on top of your kitchen caddy um, at night um, before it's full, before you um, add it to the sub pod. So I, I suggest baking soda over um, agricultural lime, which is another thing people use to... Um, to change the pH, but I think uh, baking soda is a bit safer because uh, the pH is not as extreme and um, you don't burn um, animals with the, the agricultural lime the way, uh, or sorry, you, bur you do burn them with agricultural lime uh, and that's not gonna happen with the um, bicarbo soda. But again, just a small pinch is enough. So, so in that case, you might add say um, a teaspoon of baking soda to that kitchen caddy give it a stir if you're doing bakashi and then um, go ahead and add it to the sub pod should be totally fine and then peter remember i was asking you about that rock dust um you know that your sister your sister yeah, had yeah, that they got from um that that worm company um yeah just talk about is that sort of was that did that have a mix of some sort of acid regulating material oh, yeah it ro no rock what rock dust is basically it's it's pulverized rock and so it's it's the kind of thing people are putting into their any kind of a compost system if they feel like their uh, 
compost is is deficient in minerals. So if you're one of those lucky people who's shopping at farmers markets and the farmers are growing the food for you in really good soil, they probably have plenty of minerals. But if you're having to get food from places where it's, uh, you know, in, in large chain grocery stores, it may be a bit mineral depleted. And so you can go to the nursery and get a bit of this pulverized rock. And basically it's just, as it sounds, dust of rock, rock dust. And what that's doing is it's providing minerals into the compost for eventually for the plants you're gonna grow in the compost. The other thing it provides is those tiny grains are actually, some of them would be eaten by the worms because they don't have teeth. They need a way of grinding up the food that they swallow and so like some animals do as a strategy, they'll, they'll actually swallow a brace of material that you, they use to grind the food waste uh, that goes through their gut. And so they can use some of the bigger pieces of rock dust for that. Okay, so. Cool. I think that's a getting, wrap. Getting to our time here. Yeah. Okay. Yay, great. Awesome. Nice, nice meeting you, Don. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you for coming in, Don. Thank you, thank you. I learned a lot tonight. I'll Good. keep watching you guys on YouTube. Thank you, Peter, for from the beginning to the end. And I'm gonna keep re-watching it um, and keep taking the classes, but I still need to look a little bit better for the tea compost. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 you need to get onto Grow Hub because that's where he puts all of those great articles. Have you joined Grow Hub yet? No. Just Google Grow Hub, Subpod Grow Hub, and okay. just become a member. It doesn't cost anything. And then just put up into the search function compost liquid fertilizer. And I think I've actually put it into the harvesting your compost section. I've put a copy of it in there. So there's a whole lot of great articles in there um, if, you're, if you're looking for more info on that kind of thing. Okay, I will. If you have any questions, though, like, yeah, feel free to ask. And like, even oh. if there's just, I think the cool thing about Grow Hub as well is a community there from all different parts of the world. I think there's like 13,000 of us now. So if it was something as simple as, oh, I'm thinking about buying this garden bed, you can pop it up there and people will give you some feedback on it. So Plus, yeah. you, can get, you, you can get to know people in Florida that are already using sub pods mm. and maybe build a little community together and okay. share worms and stuff with each other and plants that you've liked. And you'll see. Okay. You'll see how it goes. Okay. But she's already on there, of course, because she's like the yeah. fabulous avatar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. She is already on there. Yeah, that's how she draws. Okay, I will. So, so there's a section in, in Grow Hub uh, that's great things to do with your compost. And there's definitely the making the liquid um, fertilizers in there. I wrote an article in there and put it in there. So you should be able okay. to find it there. Okay, will do. Cool. I'll look. All right. Okay, thank you all so much. Sure. Bye. Bye. Happy Bye.